Hour 2 Overdrive continues, brought to you by FanDuel, bringing you everything from the opening line of the final score. Brian Hazio, Doug Jeff O'Neill, Jason Strudwick joining us. Uh, Mark Shapiro coming up momentarily. Strutter Dud later in the hour. The Jays are back in action tonight. And uh, I saw on FanDuel, FanDuel sent us the loony dog props that they have. They actually legitimately are taking bets on the amount of hot dogs will be purchased and consumed at the Rogers I thought they capped it. Somebody floated out they capped it. They capped what? The amount of hot dogs you can sell? Yeah, like you can't go up, like you can't go have 12 dogs. I was told that via Twitter. Somebody said they capped it, but I guess it can't be true. Well, I see that two different ways. On one side, what are you doing buying 12 hot dogs in one purchase? You know, like what is the point of that? I think people, they do it for the gram or they do it for TikTok where they're like, Watch me bury 12 dogs right now. I'm going to just make an ass of myself and a pig of myself, and I'm going to hammer 12 dogs. That could be the thinking. And then on the other side of it, though, like it's not booze. Like I understand why you cap booze. What do you care if some animal walks up and goes, I want 50 hot dogs? What does it matter? I mean, I, I, unless they feel that they're being thrown somewhere or I don't know what's going on there. Maybe we can ask Mark, are you capping hot dogs? You would probably have the answer on that. But FanDuel's got it up there where you can bet like 600000 or less is paying plus $4,000. Uh, I guess the, the shortest odds, basically what they're anticipating is somewhere between 750000 and 800000 hot dogs. There it is up on two. That on must TSM make 4. you sick, Hayes, because you don't do hot dogs. I, that, to me, I will not be contributing one dog. I will Short. not buy one. I will not eat one. But Strutty, this is like raffle tickets in Alberta, man. Right. They they do raffle out in Alberta. We do hot dogs yeah. here in 50 Ontario. Fifty fifties. We love fifty fifties. But I'm I'm a four dog guy. Four dog max. No more. No less. That's what I do. That's still just ridiculous numbers, man. Those hot dog analytics are outrageous. <laughs> Strutty, you must have been a part in your day talking about like a big order. I think back in our day, NHL players' last call orders were the most oh. obscene. <laughs> <laughs> like the 2 p.m. or the 2 a.m., it's like put 60 beers and 37 double vodkas on the bar, and the bartender's like, what? Yeah, six China Whites as well, just to nightcap. it up. Add a little color. Nice cap. <laughs> yeah, it is. If you see someone with a company card, you still see that. It's like just load this whole table up. Yeah, fill and, it up, and yeah. and don't worry, it'll be gone in ten minutes. Right. That's the frightening thing. That is what is scary at the end of the night because those bartenders are like, "You've been here for four hours. We've been watching you. <laughs> yeah, and we've been watching what you're doing. <laughs> right. How are you possibly going to consume all that? But I've also seen. I'm sure you guys have seen it. Where none of it gets. It basically just gets paid for. People have a few sips and they get kicked out. And you're like, why did you buy that? That just cost four hundred and fifty dollars, but it's all good. If you're a, if you're a baller, you're a baller. I guess you guys are saying that's what you were. Last call on your primes. You guys were making it rain, Strut. Is that what was going on, or what? I was slow dancing on the dance floor, so I wasn't ordering anything <laughs> <laughs> before the lights came on. You're like if these lights come on, man, I better scatter quick. Um, anyway, Mark Shapiro will join us here in a moment. And I guess, yeah, we got to get an update on the Looney Dogs. How many are going to get I've just got a note, Haze, and I don't. I think it's fact. One person can only grab four at a time. So you're is not that, going Is up. that to save hot dogs for other people? Dude, I don't know. Like, what, knows, what would they who, care Who if knows you're who them? decided, the Hurt Feelings crowd, somebody got involved and said, I don't like this. So who knows who that is? All right. Do you do you trust your source? Yes. Or is a, Shapiro yeah. going to come on here and just bury that take or that report and say you have no idea what you're talking about? Do you think he actually knows how many hot dogs you can get at the ballpark? I think so. One time? He's I got think a lot of things on his plate, man. You don't think that Mark <laughs> Shapiro knows what the limit is for an individual to buy a he's, hot dog? I really maybe don't. He said it. I, I really don't. It's like you. You you work in this building all the time. Would you know that there was restrictions in the Niner Diner? You wouldn't because no, you course, never go in of there. Of course not, but I don't run the operation. He does. All right, let's 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 ask him then. Let's bring him in. Here he is, the, the president and CEO <laughs> of the Toronto Blue Jays, uh, joining us here on the Maple Toyota Hotline. Here's Mark Shapiro. How you doing, Mark? I'm doing all right, guys. Hot dog analytics? Yes. Really? Ah. <laughs> yes. You guys, are you aware of them? How there, many can you I, buy at a time? Any, has there been any sports talk going on? I've been in... 
here's a national champ ba- you know, basketball game in the no. U.S. You've got the Leafs on a roll, <laughs> us at the home opener, and you guys are talking hot dog analytics. That's right. We're men of the people. I just, I'm definitely not. You're, you're mocked, but you're men of the people. I'm, <laughs> I'm definitely not aware. I am definitely out of the loop on what, uh, what sells and what the market wants to hear. Okay. Well, I, I figured you'd be on top of like, kind of like, uh, was it Robert De Niro Casino? You know how he knows how many like blueberries are yeah, in the muffin? Exactly. I assume, Mark, you know every single detail of what's going on down at that park. <laughs> you are the only person that assumes that. Okay. In, right. in the entire Toronto Metro. In fact, you're the only person throughout all of Canada that assumes that. Most yeah. people assume I know very little what's going on. Oh, no, I, I don't go down that road at all. I, I assume you'd be all over it. But uh, I, 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 how are we feeling today? I mean, you mentioned at the home opener yesterday, it was a packed yeah. house. It was a big reveal. Like, is it a, a sense of relief? Uh, you know, how, how do you describe the night last uh, night, considering the way it played out? Yeah, I mean, last night, um, man, like a lot of... <laughs> A lot of emotions, just thinking about what was pulled off and the uh, the magnitude of the feat to uh, to tear out the entire lower bowl and recreate it in less than six months. Um, some learnings, you know, we we had some issues with the new concession, uh, working with a new concessionaire in the premium section. But overall, you know, I think we were able to kind of show fans what we were trying to accomplish with the lower bowl to make it a more baseball specific you know, ballpark type atmosphere and, and take what we did in the outfield district that was so well received a year ago and pull that, you know, into the infield and in the lower bowl from foul pole to foul pole and just create some really cool seats that used to be really, really bad seats down the line and uh, offer a different, different uh, opportunity to watch the game than, uh, you know, than, than was available here in Rogers center before. And, um, overall, a good night. Just really proud of the of the exceptional effort from the thousands of construction workers that work day and night over holidays, seven days a week, and it really that that is what happened here over the last six months. To uh, you know, our support we had, you know, to fund the project from ownership to the leaders here that had to kind of do two or three different jobs, their normal job, and then you know prepare a, a major construction project. It's been. It's been a huge effort, so it was uh, it was a proud moment last night. Of one of one of a lot of uh, gratitude for me, and and today, kind of, you asked me how I'm feeling today. Today, you know, excited to kind of turn the page and get back into more routine and uh, take advantage and, and kind of enjoy the space after after the uh, the glamour that comes with night one. You must have been that must have felt different than any other kind of home opener victory where. You've put so much into it, Mark, just getting everything dialed in and the guys come home and they put on a show and you're putting all those people in the building for the first time and it's a win and everybody goes home happy. That must have felt a little different than a normal home opener. Absolutely. I mean, it's interesting because home openers always kind of conjure up for me my love of the game. The reason I'm in it, my 34th home opener, you know, working in the game, but a lot more than that, on this planet. And, you know, I think about being pulled out of school when home openers were day games growing up as a kid in Baltimore and with my siblings and with my dad and my mom. And it was, it was what, you know, my bond around with my family around the game of baseball is what drew me to the love of the game. So I always kind of view home openers as a celebration of the game, not just, you know, the team, not the individual team, but a celebration of the game and kind of a moment to, to celebrate what's coming in the year, which is warmer weather like today. And, uh, you know, in the baseball season, which is a journey, it's not, it's so hard to, to, you know, ride that wave over once 162 games, but the journey that's ahead. But last night, you know, because of, you know, the transformation of this building over the last two years, and you think about all the people involved with that. And then to get a win, you know, like you said, to showcase the building, with a lot of new people in this building to get to play so well and and to have Jose really lead us last night. It was, it was a special night. With Mark Shapiro, Jay's uh, Mariners tonight. Um, obviously there were about 40,000 people luck, luckily, you know, lucky enough to be in the building last night. There'll be millions that will walk through there uh, over the course of this season and, and throughout the upcoming years, but there's also going to be millions and millions of people throughout the country that will not be there and they'll simply be watching. Um, and I'm, I'm curious because I think a lot of people noticed right behind home plate, you know, it looks different, it feels different. 
Um, the camera angles were a little bit different last night. Can you take us through, you know, how much, you know, TV factored into to what you were thinking in terms of future media could play a role in that, the viewing experience yeah. in terms of being on your couch? And then furthermore, you know, the thought process behind the the different dim- dimensions and, and different look behind the plate in terms of the seats because it that really yeah. stuck out considering what it was the previous 34, 35 years. I thought I thought the third part of the question was and the rationale between the hot dog quota. That, <laughs> yes, if you can mix that in, please, <laughs> please, please weave that in. That yes. answer every every answer you give. Um, yeah, listen, that's a that's a great question, such a good question that I, I don't think that was you know part of the driving factor individually. I think where media factored in was the understanding that as premium kind of switches from sweets, which it was 10, 20, definitely 30 years ago when this place was designed and built to more the premium actually exists in the seats, you know, that are from base to base or dugout to dugout in the first 20, 30 rows and clubs behind that. The issue is, you know, keeping people in those seats rather than just having them go back in the clubs. And when we open our clubs in July, you know, that's something we gave a lot of thought of. How can we create seats that people don't want to leave, that they don't want to go back into the clubs, whether it's the, you know, the food they were able to serve them from an app or, you know, to stay in there, whether it's the quality of the seats or the tables that you could see, you know, in between the seats. You couldn't see that on TV, but you could see there was space between those seats right behind home plate. So it was more kind of understanding what premium looks like in the biggest markets in all of Major League Baseball um, and in, you know, thinking about what that will continue to be moving forward than it was media. But there was some awareness that we're not, you know, we don't want those seats to look empty like they do in Yankee Stadium a lot of times. You know, you see it's actually pretty crowded there, but people are underneath eating in, in restaurants instead of sitting in their seats. With uh, Mark Shapiro, in terms of, you know, what other possible events went into this planning? I I saw that the foul polls, you know, there's been a lot of talk on that, what you guys decided to do there, and how much of it is event-based, event-driven. I've heard the name Taylor Swift come up, Mark. I'm curious if you can give us any details on if Swifty had any role in the way this thing was built. Yeah, how does that I think I, I actually have gotten that question a couple times, surprisingly. No, we didn't factor. We were already underway in our planning okay. <laughs> when we got when we got the Tay Tay concerts. Uh, you know, I can I can claim to be a veteran of four or five shows with my daughter growing up, which is uh, she's quite an entertainer. Um, so we're excited to host those. But no, I mean, there it was. You can imagine the number of details and the number of decisions we have to make. Anybody who's you know done a renovation project, which in this city is pretty common, or or built a home at any point in their lives, and think about the hundreds of decisions you've got to make when you're making decisions of the magnitude of. You know, you're redesigning and rebuilding an entire lower bowl, which is kind of building part of a new ballpark after you built the outfield project, which was a massive undertaking. Who are you directing those spaces towards? Like in the outfield, what new fans are you trying to attract? Uh, What spaces, you know, how do they want to watch the game? Because the reality of kind of the difference of the mid eighties uh, and late eighties was standard definition television, you know, okay. Easy to differentiate between that and going to a, a ballpark or a stadium. Right. I mean, you can actually see the ball rather than, you know, not many people remember what that even looks like anymore. Now, you know, people have the ability to kind of sit in, you know, man caves in the basement, uh, you know, and watch a game or incredible, you know, high definition pictures with surround sound and large screen televisions and, um, or go to a, a you know a uh, sports bar and watch it there. So we're trying to create whatever it is that's compelling that would bring fans out. And number one, always winning. But after that, what brings other people out in the city, a dynamic, diverse, international city like Toronto to come to the game? And we're competing on a much more diverse, uh, you know, sports entertainment land- landscape. So trying to create the Corona rooftop bar to be the coolest patio, you know, in all of Toronto, trying to create some of the best uh, cool experiences in in different little small standing areas in the outfield over the bullpens and connect our our fans to the Garrett fans closer to the players, which they used to be removed, as you guys know, um, just because of the circular nature. All those things were kind of considerations for us, along with the premium clubs that we just talked about. 
Mark, you know, now that you've seen that, that what, what, what you've accomplished, were there any pieces as you went through the renovation idea and creation that you were unsure of and maybe had to be convinced of, and now you're really happy the way it, it, it turned out and, and you were, you know, I guess, pleasantly surprised? Oh, that's interesting. I spent the bulk of my time thinking about the player facilities because that's an area I've always had a lot of interest in and thinking about how, you know, player facilities can impact performance and culture and optimize kind of the resources that you get your players and then trying to create that smooth transition from Dunedin to here. And Marty Starkman and Anouk Karunaradne, who's now with the Cardinals, really took ownership of a lot of the fan-facing spaces. Um, I don't, I think it felt like we were, you know, directing, we, we, we spent a lot of time kind of going out to the patios in Toronto and going to restaurants in Toronto and talking to the people that run the most successful spaces and kind of trying to think about what is inherently part of this city and part of the fans that come, uh, you know, spend time and energy at, at both sporting events and entertainment events in Toronto um, so for me, obviously, uh, you know, I am not a, uh, you know, a frequent, uh, uh, visitor to a lot of those spots. So it was, it was trusting the people that did that research and spent that time, you know, thinking about those things, nothing really overly surprising, except how great those spaces turned out. And to me, like to go up to Corona rooftop during a game, which I've done a couple of times and see that people are out there dancing during a game is kind of a surprising thing, right? Like they, you know, we hit a home run, they kind of look up you know slap high fives and go back to kind of doing a <laughs> sing-along or dancing it just it's not, that's an odd thing for me who grew up only watching games for the last 35 years behind home plate so mark you're very busy you've been wearing two hats with this project and if your day planner said you know april 2024 home opener the reno's done it's just back to baseball like how do you attack this now is it just assessing the team and looking at strength and weaknesses Like, how does your day change now that this is over? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I I always kind of view my job as to moving wherever the leverage lies and, you know, being being here as a resource and support to whatever that looks like. Um, Certainly the highest leverage work that we do is the team on the field. So I'm here for to help support Ross. Uh, and our baseball operations staff in any way that I can. I, I'm not. I'm not sure how much I have to offer. I definitely have more to offer there than I do on hot dog quotas. But uh, you know, um, you know, I, we've got a bunch of work to do. You know, to get ready for the draft. We've got, you know, to think about. You know, what the trade deadline will look like for us, and what, whether we'll be active there, and and just make sure our staff uh, and our players understand the space. And we'll, we'll end up showing that to you guys in the next couple of months. We're just waiting till we kind of finish some of the final construction underneath here. It is a massive space down here. So learning how they can use it, making sure that um, they take, they're able to take full advantage of it and, and the adjustments we have to make uh, in a lot of the spaces here, we'll have a punch list much bigger than anybody's house punch list. So I think most of my time, is going to be spent on that. And then a, a lot of my role too is, you know, representing ownership at the league level. Um, so we're working on some interesting projects with whether it's ABS, the automatic ball strike system, um, the evolution of kind of thinking about pitching injuries and how we can uh, try to create a, a, you know, a safer environment for our pitchers and keep guys healthy. Um, or even, you know, thinking about the schedule in the long term and, how do we look at, you know, in a very long-term plan, what are, what's, you know, what could be most dynamic for fans, most interesting for fans? Is that, you know, a mid-season tournament like, like the NBA has done, half seasons, um, you know, things like that. So thinking about optimal schedules long-term. So I do spend a lot of my time on, that, on those things as well. With Mark Shapiro, you, you, you piqued my interest there with pitcher's health. Um, I'm sure you, you heard or saw what Verlander was saying the other day. Uh, it appears to be, you know, it is a real issue in baseball. The, the amount of arms, whether it's forearm, elbow, shoulder, um, whether it's an ace, if it's a fifth man in a rotation, it's hanging over the sport. Uh, and I'm, I'm curious, I mean, you've been in baseball for a long time. You run this yeah. club. You've had issues with your own guys. You'll undoubtedly have issues with your guys in the future. Is this like the top of mind discussion in baseball, how you protect pitchers moving forward? Well, pitcher health has always been an issue as long as I've been in it. It's always been a fragile area. I've always, I've always felt, and you could go back to any conversation you've had with any baseball executive, and you're going to never feel comfortable with the five-man rotation. It's like I need to be seven or eight deep to survive a season. Um, it's just the nature of pitching is 
uh, a very unnatural physical act. It's tough on the skeletal structure, it's, and, and the body will find the weakest link, right? So whether that's a ligament, whether that's a tendon, whether that's a bone, um, you know, and I think what's happened, and this is anecdotal in my opinion, but as we have trained specific pitchers so much more sports specific uh, to throw baseballs harder, and, and you guys have seen that. You can watch a game and see starting pitchers you know, throwing 97, 98 for five or six innings. Well, that, that didn't exist when I came into the game. You know, guys were more contact-oriented. contact, contact oriented. Um, You know, they, they located pitches and changed speeds, and now it's, you know, dominate for the first four or five innings and then bring in a power bullpen behind that. So we are training power, power, power with our pitchers. And I think what happens is that we have bigger, stronger, more physical optimized velocity, high velocity pitchers, you know, the, the body is finding that weak link because we're creating so much torque and force um, in deliveries. And I think that's, that's probably something we need to think about, you know, where, what are the counters that we can put into place for that? That's not an easy question. There's a lot of different ways to approach it, but those are the kind of things we're thinking about. Yeah, and I would assume there's a, a pushback even from the pitchers because they understand if they do hit 97, 98, 99 on the clock, they're going to make a lot of money, you know, if they if they can stay healthy. So it's kind of it's not just it can't only be baseball's problem or the league's problem. The the players' association and the pitchers themselves likely would have to factor into that. But who's going to take no that doubt. first step and say, "Oh, I'll start throwing 88, 89"? and get rocked every single game, you won't be in Major yeah. League Baseball much longer. No, I think we've got to create an even playing field. The best pitchers and the best players are always going to be you know, paid extremely well. That's just the nature of the way it should work and, and does work. And so uh, we've got to create a, a level playing field where it's just not maybe uh, as sustainable or as successful to just be a, mock, a max velo guy, whether that's you know, the limits of the, of the number of pitchers and the staff and what it takes to survive, that there'll still be the right number of guys that, that you know, succeed and there'll still be the same number of players on the team. So we, we wouldn't do anything to change the compensation system, but just trying to keep guys. And I think, you know, not being anecdotal like I'm being right now, I'm coming in with a, some real data-driven information before we move forward. But it is something that we are studying. It's something that we need to attack. And, and, and I think what you point out is correct. It's something that we keep before we make change. We need to engage and work with the players on that. Well, we got another game tonight, and uh, what is it? Eighty more home games this year, and then hopefully into That's the playoffs. It. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So when you get those hot dog numbers, circle back, Mark. Let us know. It's four. Anticipate. It is. I can confirm. It's four. It's four. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm not I a hot dog guy. Confirm, I cannot confirm the intestinal, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, formula that right. went into saying that you know we can. We are the proper magnitude of hot dog con- consumption for a single individual is the, or the optimal number is four. But uh, I can tell you that where we arrived and where it shook out, uh, and you know we, we're all about equality. We want hot dogs for everyone, and want to make sure that uh, you know we are you know we're, we're we are you know leaders of the people and make sure that we are. It's a free hot dog world. For them. There you go. Yeah, we support that. We're, we're right there behind you. We're pushing that message as well, and we'll continue that. Uh, Thank you. Yes, congrats, obviously, on getting everything up and running, and uh, good you. luck the rest of the way. I'm sure we'll do it again soon. Thank you, Mark. Look forward to it. Thanks so much. There's uh, Mark Shapiro, president and CEO of the Blue Jays. Um, yeah, listen, they've, they've invested hundreds of millions of dollars, so you know this, this is going to be the park for a long time. You know, there obviously was talk, and we talked to Mark about that years ago. Remember, there was a report, I think the Globe and Mail had a report, that they were investigating the idea of building a new park altogether. And not happening now. Not going to happen now. And COVID, I think, factored into that. I think the nature of the building, where it is in the city, and now these these renos, I mean, this is going to be likely the, where, the, where the Jays play for maybe for the next 100 years. You know, I, who knows? So, um, yeah, if you're lucky enough to get down there, obviously it's a really cool experience, but a lot of people just be watching from home, and I'm sure that'll continue tonight. The Jays 5-6 and six going into a game tonight, Bassett on the mound. We're on that with our best bets brought to you by FanDuel. All right, Strud or Dud is forthcoming, all right? We got Masters takes, hockey takes, and we got a lot of different takes, all right? <laughs> Strud muffin Strud is muffins. back. <laughs> Fire up the oven. Fire yeah. up the oven. There's a batch of strud muffins going right in. All right. Man. They're coming out of the oven, and we'll do that next. 
All right, usually it's confirm and deny, but we can confirm that has been pushed aside for strud or dud, and it's brought to you by Summit Ford and South Lake Ford Lincoln, where they there are no trade deadlines. They'll take anything on trade and save you the HST. Visit summitford.com or southlakeford.com. Let's do it a little quickly this time, and I'm going to be a judge because I was so good at judging yesterday, and I'm going <laughs> to name a winner after this. It's either Hazy B or Strud Muffin. Okay, Hazy B, it. go ahead. All right. Strud or dud, Canadian teams' cup odds are lower than they should be because of the 30-year drought. That is strud. That is strud. And um, I told you guys yesterday, you slap Canada in the face too much. I think the Oilers, the Jets, the Canucks, you guys dumped all over the Vancouver Canucks. You had them at 10 or 11 in mm -hmm. your top 12. If Demko gets a net and they can all put it together, the Canadian teams are going to do serious damage in the playoffs. I truly believe that. Okay. Yeah. I've got it as that as well. Like I think that the, the teams, those guys weren't around 30 years ago. This isn't like a repeatable thing. So I believe that the teams are who they are. They're they're playing well. They've got you know a chance to, to to compete and do well. But it doesn't matter what happened in the past. It's what happens you know starting game 83 for these four teams. Yeah, I'll say it's a strud because the odds are what they are, and Canadians are going to hammer them anyway. You know, it doesn't matter what the history is. Canadians are going to hammer the Leafs, the Oilers, the Canucks. If you're in Winnipeg, you'll hammer the Jets. I do think, though, they get viewed differently because of the history. It's like, ah, Canadian teams never win. And, and you got 70 sheets in the bank. Do you think you care about a 30-year-old streak? That you're I'm not, not saying the players care. It's not about the players. We're talking about the perception of betters, of gamblers, of bookies. It's almost like there's this, and understandably, they have a reputation they never win. Like, there hasn't been a Canadian team in 30 years. You know, they, how many times have we even been to a cup final as a Canadian team since then? You know, it, it's not a not a lot. Eight, ten. Um, all right, strud or dud? Tiger Woods makes the cut and shoots under par for the tournament. Dud, 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 dud. He can't walk. He can't hit a sand wedge from a hundred yards. You? He's not having are sex. He's a rattled. Hator. No, I'm not a hater. I am a realist, and I always have been. Nothing more, nothing less. All right. And he can't hit the shots. He can't walk. It'll be a mess by Friday morning, whatever, his, how his tea, if he's late, early, early, well, late. He's, he's by the late time he gets early. on 10 T yeah. on Friday, he'll be a mess. I'm you sorry. You are a hater. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> That's just the truth. Haterade consumption. Yeah. I'm with O'Doc. This is a dud. Listen, the, the, the spirit wants it so badly, and I know he wants to get another championship or, or sorry, another major, but it's not going to happen. The body can't answer the call. It, it's going to break down. The, I said earlier, he's going to be walking the limp by Friday, and then you can't compete like that. Other players have to do it with perfect health and just mm -hmm. thinking about the game, understanding. Like I said, the spirit of Tiger wants it. The body's going to let him down. I am going to say this is a dud he is going late early but it looks like rain's coming thursday which is a little bit concerning because it could roll over his round but that means on friday though he may roll right back into his his second 18 and he might have to play 20 25 27 holes 30 holes on friday which is concerning albeit the weather's looking real nice friday i think he makes the cut he makes it every single year you know, Freddie Couples is going to miss. Olaf Thobble's going to miss. Like the old time guys, Woozy, your boy, Stads, they'll go out there and hack it <laughs> around and miss. Woozy's not going back out there. And whoever's out there is going to miss. And the amateurs will miss. Tiger's going to make the cut. Under par is a little bit concerning. I'm not convinced this guy shoots one under for the tournament. But if he makes the, the weekend, the roars will be there. It'll be, it's beautiful weather, projecting to be beautiful weather on the weekend. Yeah, I'm going to say dud. I think Tiger can do it. Uh, or I'm going to say strut. I think Tiger can do it. Side uh, note, at the Champions Dinner, when they take the pick, have a look at Woozy's face because it will be so beat red after just gooning scotch up in that. In the in the cabin. In the butler cabin. Yeah. He'll be soiled by the it's, end of that. Have a look at his, his grill. It's my favorite picture every year. It's him and the walrus right beside each other, and they're in the back absolutely <laughs> cooked. Having a great time. I love it. Uh, Strutter Dud, David Pasternak should be higher in the heart rankings than Artemi Panarin. I'm going to say Strud to this because you look at the success of the Boston Bruins the last two years, and we go to the big dog in Toronto, we go to the big dog in Tampa, the big dog in Edmonton. It's like he is the big dog, and they have been the most successful team over the past two seasons. 
And it's almost like everyone says, ah, he's a flashy guy down in Boston. This guy's an incredible talent, yeah, man, and he leads player. the charge. And he's got way more points than anyone else in his team. And it's not like he's going out there with rock stars all the time either. Like, if Bergeron's gone. I don't think he plays with Marchand full-time. Mm -mm. He's a wrecking crew by himself. He deserves more love. No, I'm going to go with Panarin. Uh, I think that Panarin, he is having a career year. He's, he's, he's exceeded anything he's done in the past. Uh, scoring points, it's, it's, it's really incredible. And I think he's taken another step in his game. And not that Pasta hasn't, but we've seen Pasta get to or close to these types of numbers in the past. Yeah, it's crazy. Like, Panarin's got 115 points. He he, Dude, he's he could a hit talent. fifty goals and one hundred and fifty points, and he's forty Crazy. points up off Vinny Vinny Trocheck. And it's the same thing. Boston and New York up the middle, the same thing. Trocheck is Coil, you know. Zaka is a Binajad or whichever way you want to phrase it. Like I'm telling you, well, you got to look at that when you're talking about playoffs. Middle of the ice is very substantial, but I, I will I will strut this as well because I I think Pasternak is just he's got he's only got a couple more goals in him, but. I think he's going to hit 50. I think he's more important to his team. Although, Panarin, I love Panarin. The, the truth is, it could be 50 50. This could be a, I can no, neither strut or dud, but I'm not Fergie, so I'm not going to do that. So I'm going to strut it because I'm going to make this a lifetime achievement award. Ty goes to the guy who did it more last year, too. Which Don't is you totally, dare bring Fergie into strut or dud. This is a no <laughs> fly zone for him. He should not be affiliated with No whatsoever. fly zone. And I know this year's heart has nothing to do with the past before people start jumping on me. I understand that, but I have to break the ice somewhere. I think they've equally been phenomenal for their teams. Uh, I'll, I'll go with Pasternak. Um, Strud or Dud, a Canadian will finish in the top 10 at the Masters this week. I am going to open the oven, put it on 450, <laughs> and put the biggest batch of Strud muffins into the <laughs> oven and put on high heat because this is a Strud. Yeah. And I think my guy Nick Taylor is going to be the one. He seems like a big game hunter right now. Like he's putting himself in positions in big tournaments with big dogs. He's not afraid of the moment. Duthie just talked about his drone routine. I have no idea what he even said. <laughs> but I think my guy, Nikki Taylor, could do some damage. Corey Connors, man. Connors loves this track, man. He's Dude, playing well, too. He, he hits a draw. He dials his irons. One day that's got to translate into something on that golf course. Yep. <laughs> a lot of good players out there, but I'll, I'll take a bite. Give me a stud muffin. I'll take a bite. I think that, you know, Come as a Canadian, man. I, I, I want the Canadians to do well. I, I want to, I, I'd like to see a top 10 finish by a Canadian. I remember, mm -hmm. I remember watching when Weir won it. It was really exciting. Um, and you feel good as a Canadian. We want to see yep. Canadians compete at the highest levels in other sports other than just kind of our, our main one, which is soccer and, and hockey. So, yeah, I'm I'm hopeful, but I think it's also possible. So, yes, take a big bite. Okay, I agree. I, I'm going to strut muffin this one myself wow. because I, I'm, I think Hadwin, Taylor, Connors all make the cut. I like Hadwin here, too. He's playing well this season. Connors loves this place. I had a little birdie tell me he was walking around with the three of them today. Weirzy as well. He said they're all in good spirits. They all look good. They're all striping the ball. Connors loves this place. Loves this place. So Corey Connors, T10. I think Nick Taylor, you're right. If Taylor's in the running on the weekend, he will sniff out a leaderboard. Like if he is, if he's within a few shots on Saturday, I guarantee you he shoots under par on Saturday and he will be in the hunt on Sunday. The moment will not be too big for him. Uh, I like Taylor. I like Connors. I think Havon will make the cut. I could see a t T25, T30 for him. So yeah, Strud Muffins, 450. Round the horn, heat. everybody, shake and bake. Open up the oven and grab one. <laughs> the okay. muffin, man. I like it. All right, well, you're the judge. How do you feel about that? I think I won the segment. I'm not going to lie. I had some funny surprise. stuff. Some. Oh, I'll try it. I'm just being honest. I got to be the judge, and I think I just had some creative answers. My Pasternak rant was pretty good. Mm-hmm. I'm going to open back up the oven and just give myself the tray. I didn't think not you were sharing. included, though, Struddy. Was it not uh, my understanding he was going to vote on it was uh, us who were competing against each other? All right, I'll give it to Struddy the then. He's the, was Struddy is the owner of the segment. i got to give it to the owner because I don't want to hear any blowback. You're, you're the kind of guy in the men's league that in a, with a penalty shot that's open, you call your own number, right? It's like, I'll, I got this, and then mm -hmm. you don't get a shot off. Like You can't call your own number when you're judging a competition. It yeah. doesn't make sense. He's on the take. He's on the take. It's very disappointing. Uh, Strutter Dud was brought to you by Summit Ford and South Lake Ford Lincoln, where there are no trade deadlines. They'll take anything on trade and save you the HST. Visit summitford.com or southlakeford.com.
Uh, Jack Hughes out, done for the season. So he won't Oof. be playing tonight, won't be playing Thursday either. But uh, Leafs Devils on TSN Radio and on TSN 4 tonight. Lindsey Hamilton, the whole crew, the quiz tonight, the belt on the line. Pulling for you, man. I'll Pulling see. for you. I'll, that's another one. I, I think I have to determine where it goes. So if I have the choice, obviously I'm going to keep it myself. Yeah. But who knows? <laughs> Lindsey might think that she – come on, Strutty. you got to yeah. represent – you yeah, might have different ideas. Huh? Absolutely. you got to pat yourself yeah. on the back. Yeah, I got, got dissed for the whole season. i got to right. get some love in return. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right, enjoy it. We'll see you again tomorrow at 4 p.m. We'll chat then. Yes, we will. There's the old dog, Jeff O'Neill. All right, Struddy, you and I keep rolling here. MJ coming up from the rink in about 25 minutes. Ryan Rashog on McDavid missing practice today. What happens with him into the future? And we'll take a look at the Western Conference and the Western Canadian teams with Vancouver picking up a big win last night. Maybe a couple of Strutter duds sprinkled in as well. I like that idea. A couple sprinkled in as we go on here. Overdrive continues, TSN 1050 and on TSN 4. All right, Mike Johnson coming up. Johnny will join us in about 20 minutes. Ryan Rashog as well on the Leafs, the Oilers, Connor McDavid. Not at practice today. And, Struddy, you always say it this time of year. I mean, everyone's banged up. I just figured maintenance, like, who cares if a guy like that practices? What's he working on? His breakouts and, (laughs) you know, at this time of year. I think he'll be okay. I think he'll figure it out. But, uh if he misses a game or two, it's it only it needs is one game to hit a hundred assists, and then that's out of the way. And I understand what hangs over McDavid, the Oilers. It's the same thing with Matthews and the Leafs. You you can't go out of your way to suggest that anything other than the playoffs matter to you. But these guys, they're humans. They understand their own legacy. They understand all the work that went in to get to this point. I'd actually find it refreshing if McDavid said. First things first, obviously health and playoffs, but second thing second, I want to get 100 assists. You know, and the <laughs> same thing with Matthews. I want to score 70. Like, why would you not want that? And if you do score 70 or if you get 100 assists, doesn't mean you're getting swept in the first round. No, I think I think it can all I think it can all work out. So, you know, McDavid's day-to-day. So what does that mean? It could be three days. It could be he plays tomorrow. It could be, you know, next week. But he's one away. So, you know, let's say he gets to a place where he feels he's pretty healthy and pretty comfortable. I'm going to play the last game. He could probably get that point in that last game or they're going to force it to, to, to get it because it does make a difference. At the end of the day, these guys are also human and they're not going to go uh, a captain uh, like Connor or, you know, an ultimate player like uh, Matthews. They're not going to go out of the way to hurt the team mm-hmm. to, to get these goals. But it just happens to be that with them doing what they're doing, it also coincides with the team having success, preparing for the playoffs, preparing for game 83. Those are all things you can do. It's not like you're going to send out, uh, you know, trying to get Bobby McMahon, uh, McMahon 30 goals. You right. know what I mean? Like, it's, 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 it's something that is parallel to what you're trying to accomplish as a team. And as teammates, you want guys to hit those milestones. I remember playing with a guy, a couple of different guys that scored 50 and Yarmir Jagger. And I remember that the year he got 50, I felt a great sense of pride. Now, I don't think I passed him once. <laughs> Maybe in warm-up I passed to him, but you <laughs> right. still get that number. And you're like, I was there. I was part of it. I helped him. Or a goalie having a good season. Or someone getting you know, an award. You you want your teammates to do well because it, it's they're part of you and you're part of them. And so I think that's really important for fans to understand. There is there is isn't a way to do both at the same time. I think that's really well put and I think it is important to point out that this is an exclusively Canadian hockey story and, and mentality. This I, I do buy stock on of how it's different up here than it is in the in the U.S. You know, a lot of other things I don't necessarily buy into. Um, you know, the pressure of it all, the media, all that kind of stuff. I understand there's more people around the scrum, but you're in the modern day, in the modern game, the PR teams protect players. Like there, there's a lot of days here where Matthews won't speak, Marner won't speak. They don't have to talk all the time. They don't sit there and do exclusive interviews every single day. When they're away from the rink, they're completely away from everything. They get to control all of that. But I do think the idea that you, you have to be some, you have to be bashful or something, or you, you have to somehow, you know, pretend as if you don't even notice you're on the brink of a milestone, out of fear that people will say, "Wow, your your head's in the wrong place." You know, why aren't you thinking about the playoffs every single second uh, is exclusively Canadian and is ridiculous. And I think actually <laughs> almost counterintuitive to, to what you're talking about in terms of good mojo going to the playoffs. Because like you said, this is a team, it's almost a bonding 
yeah. situation, right? It's like a team building situation where Matthews is not cheating. McDavid's not cheating. McDavid gets to he just in his sleep can do what he's doing. Like he's not he's not jumping the zone. He's not he doesn't have an empty net and he's stopping saying, "Hey, can I pass this so I can get an assist instead of scoring goals?" That's not happening. And Matthews the same thing. If you watch him, which we are every night, this guy's a machine on both ends of the night. Uh, both ends of the ice. And he's not playing 30 minutes a night to chase a stat. It's naturally coming to him. His teammates are ecstatic for him. And I think the idea of him hitting a 70 goals, if we're going to use Matthews and the Leafs as an example, I think it could be really galvanizing. And really, it, it drives energy because they know where they're going. They're going to the playoffs. They're likely playing Florida. They're likely starting on the road. What do you have right now? Obviously, you want health. But on top of that, what else can you get? Wins, good mojo. Matthews hit 70. Everyone's buzzing. Uh, I think that can be a good thing in the end. It sure can be. And and you know, let's just take the example of Zach Hyman. Never had 50 goals. No mm-hmm. one believed in him. And when he scored that 50th goal, the reaction from – well, first his reaction, I thought it was very authentic, and then his teammates' reaction. Anyone who got within arm's reach was hugging this player. These are grown men who are you know paid to play a game, and the reaction was so – pure. You know, Corey Perry said, welcome to the club. Like, I, I love that. I love that moment. If you're on that bench, it brings energy to your group, and you're so happy for Zach Hyman. Um, now, there's areas of the game you're trying to clean up, and every coach, whether it's you know Winnipeg, Toronto, Edmonton, Vancouver, wherever, mm-hmm. they're all trying to dial in little areas of the game. You know, we want to tighten up our power play, our penalty kill, whatever, our neutral zone, whatever, forecheck, whatever it is. But it doesn't mean you're sacrificing those things to get to these goals because you know what? They're almost there already by doing the same thing every night they've been doing. Yeah. Are there nights where you cheat? Yeah, everyone cheats. There are some times where everyone doesn't back check. But most of the time, these guys are doing the right thing. That's how it works. So I, 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 you know, I, when I played, I wasn't really much into stats, probably not a real surprise. But, you know, now that I'm away from the game, I do look back on things that players accomplished, whether it's before me, during my time, or after, mm-hmm. and think, I, I marvel. I marvel that someone can score, you know, like McGill, do you think the year he scored 70 goals? Or, um, you know, Wayne Gretzky, how many years of 100 assists in a, in a row? Or, you know, even a D-man get to 100 points. What doesn't matter the era. Like, those are incredible things that players accomplish. And I, I know how hard it is. It's so hard to do it. You're doing it against the best of the best, and you're still doing those numbers. It's, it's crazy. It's crazy. It is. And if you marry the regular season success with playoff success, that's what makes it blow up that much more. You know, like yeah. you, you referenced hitting 100 points as a defenseman. Carlson did that last year, but it was on San Jose, you know, the worst team yeah. in the league. <laughs> so, you know, it got the nest, it probably got, it got attention. It didn't get the necessary attention or certainly what it was worthy of because of how substantial the statistics were, because the Sharks weren't on anybody's radar. Where if you look at, at what Matthews is doing, you look at what Hyman and McDavid's doing. Another guy here is Willie. Like Nylander's four yeah. points away from 100. Crazy. There's no winger in Leaf history has hit 100 points. Like that, that is really a substantial statistic. Like his dad played in the league for the longest time. I don't believe Michael ever had a hundred points. I'm pretty sure he didn't. No. Um, so, yeah. you know, the idea of, of Nylander hitting a hundred is, is massive. And it's, it's a testament. It, the idea of bottling the last two weeks and saying, well, it was the only thing that mattered. What you're doing is you're, you're cheapening the, the previous five and a half months where these guys battled and grind and performed and produced at a level that is is truly elite across the board. And the idea that Matthews could hit 70, Nylander could hit 100 points, McDavid could hit 100 assists, and Hyman score 50-plus goals, like that's just incredible, just using Toronto and Edmonton as an example. And then on top of that, in terms of a legacy – we all know what a cup would represent in both cities, both markets for all, you know, these great players. McDavid's, you know, a generational player. Matthews is not far behind them. They're already going to the Hall of Fame. They're already in the conversation for, you know, best of all time at whatever they do. But the idea of like Matthews scoring 70 and then winning a cup, like that becomes one of the truly great seasons of all time. <laughs> like McDavid, 100 assists, and yeah. the Oilers win a cup. All of a sudden, you look at what he's accomplished the last two years. You could bottle those two years and say, all right, who are we comparing these to? Like, who else? Are we talking Lemieux in the early 90s, Gretzky in the mid, mid-80s? mid Like, that's how good this guy's been. And if you pair it with a cup, it just – it takes it to a completely different level. It does. And, you know, you talk about, you know, cities that haven't won a championship for a while. I always think of Cleveland and when LeBron James left. 
yep. one in Miami, and then returned. And you know, I, I I jumped on the bandwagon for for that run when when they they you know he came back the second time to Cleveland. I wanted that community to win a championship, right? That that I think that they they deserved it. And LeBron, it was his, near his hometown there, and he got it done. So you know, for a Canadian team. To you know, hopefully this year, and, and you know, even though it hurts, I would I would even grudge, grudgingly be happy if the Leafs win it because it comes back to Canada. And Adam I know there's Boy, Canadian players all over the place, um, and there and all over there's Canadian play, players all playing in the states, and I, mm. I get all that. But it is nice just for it to just to come back to Canada and the, and the celebration would be crazy. But if you look at the teams, I think that you know. Toronto's polarizing. I don't have to even get into that. But yeah, of course. I think Vancouver is can be a little bit polarizing as well. Mm-hmm. You know, Edmonton with McDavid, there's maybe some jealousies. I'm not sure. But I think I think if the final if, if it is Winnipeg in the final, I think that most of Canada would cheer for Winnipeg. I'm I not agree. sure we'd cheer for the other three teams. I think you'd might, you know, nod if they score, you might be happy. But I just feel like Winnipeg, if they get there, you're like, yeah, I'll cheer for those Everyone's guys. Everyone's cool three, with Winnipeg. I'm not sure. Yeah, it's either no one's got a take on it or everyone loves them. All right, like it's yeah. either oh, I don't know, I never really thought of that. Sure, I'll jump on, or yeah, like I'm all about Portage in Maine. Let's get that place right. fired up. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm good with that. I agree with you. Winnipeg's the middle ground where everyone can come together as long as their team yes. is already out. Uh, final hour coming up. <laughs> Mike Johnson yeah. will join us and Ryan Rashog. Strutty sticking around. I'm Brian Hayes. Overdrive continues. TSN 1050 and on the TSN app.